Uh, welcome, everyone, for being here, not only the economists in the room. My name is Tom Lenny. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture here at the college. The McFarland Center sponsors a range of lectures, conferences, discussions that foster dialogue on questions of meaning, morality, and mutual obligation. You can find a schedule of our events, uh, videos of past events, including this one in a few days, on our website at holycross.edu slash McFarland Center. Today I'm really grateful to be working with the campus, the Holy Cross Phi Beta Kappa Society chapter, to co-sponsor this Phi Beta Kappa Society visiting scholar lecture. I'm grateful to my friend and colleague, Professor Melissa Boyle, the chair of the economics department, for uh, the chance to sponsor this event together. And I'm pleased to welcome uh, Professor Nina Pauchik to speak on how globalization shapes inequality. Tomorrow she'll be joining some classes, maybe from some of yours. Professor Pauchik is Niehaus Family Professor of International Studies and Professor of Economics at Dartmouth College. Her research examines how international trade affects the lives of workers, families, and children, with implications for inequality and poverty in lower income countries. She also studies how companies around, uh, how companies respond to challenges and opportunities of globalization. Professor Pauchik is author of World Bank Economic Review, as editor of the World Bank Economic Review, and co-editor of the Journal of Economic Perspectives. She served as editor of the United Nations publication, Trade Policies, Household Welfare, and Poverty Alleviation. In 2014, she authored, uh, in 2014, she's authored dozens of articles and book chapters as well. A native of Slovenia, she's been a consultant on global trade to, to the World Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, and United Nations and U.S. Department of Labor. At Dartmouth, Professor Pauchik uh, served as chair of the Department of Economics and, reserved the, and received the Dean of Faculty Award for Outstanding Mentoring and Advising. She is a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research and a research fellow in the Center for Economic Policy Research. So please join me in welcoming Professor Nina Pauchik. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, hosting me. Uh, this is actually my last Phi Beta Kappa uh, visit. Uh, it, it's been really a lot of fun visiting lots of colleges uh, throughout, and I'm glad I'm uh, finishing, it, uh, uh, finishing it here. I, uh, in addition to being a professor, I'm also mom of two college students, so I appreciate uh, those uh, students who showed up for showing up here. Uh, you know, I'll keep telling my kids, like, go to lectures. Like, this is why I pay high tuition, uh, but I don't know if they listen to me. So. Uh, what I'm going to do today is uh, I will um, give you some key facts about what we have learned uh, in a large body of uh, economic research about how globalization shapes um, inequality. And this is a very timely uh, question because um, we, up to 2016, we pretty much thought that most countries, both rich and poor in the world, have kind of agreed that uh, engaging with each other in international trade is going to raise their prosperity, and it's, it's a good thing. However, in 2016, uh, the United States became protectionist again. Uh, the United Kingdom uh, uh, exited United, uh, European Union, right, with, with Brexit. So. We, we have started questioning again, you know, is there, do we con have continued support for, uh, for, for freer trade? And as economists, whenever we see that countries are raising protectionism, we have this knee-jerk reaction to lecture people and say, but like, listen, trade is really, really good for a country as a whole. And we feel that like people don't understand that and that's why they're raising uh, barriers to, uh, to, to commerce. So, so that's what economists uh, emphasize. And w when, when uh, you know, the United States started raising uh, uh, trade barriers, I became kind of curious, like, what do regular people think uh, about uh, trade? Is it good for uh, a country as a whole or not so good? And there's actually a survey uh, of, uh, that asks this question to people in many countries in the world and kind of in a nationally representative way. So people were asked, you know, what do you think about growing trade and business ties between United States and other countries? Uh, and they, you know, for people in India, they ask similar question for, you know, from the perspective of India, you know, do you think trade is a very good thing or somewhat good thing, somewhat bad or very bad thing for your country, okay? So how many, like out of 10 Americans, how many do you think said that trade was very good or somewhat good? 
So more than five would say that or less than five? How many think that more than five would say that? Okay, more than six out of 10. More than seven out of 10. More than eight, nine? Actually, well, this, are, this is, here is the United States. Uh, uh, this is the you know, kind of the, uh, percent of people saying that trade uh, and business ties are uh, good or very good for an economy. You see that actually almost seven out of ten Americans in the you know in the 2010s believe that tra trade was actually really good for the United States overall. And what's actually really in, I, you know and, and I did similar analysis for other countries that are substantially poorer, like you know Vietnam, China, India, Colombia, Mexico, and others. And you see that in all of these countries. The majority of people, so over like you know, more than five out of 10 people, think that trade is actually good for their country as a whole. So you know, this, this doesn't often happen, but public at large actually agrees with economists' knee-jerk reaction, right? <laughs> so w w what's the catch? Well, it becomes much tornier when, when the same survey asks people about how trade impacts the livelihoods of, of workers. And what the survey here asks is uh, ask whether or not trade um, lower wages, destroys jobs, or raises wages and creates jobs. And you see here that you know, five, you know, 50 percent of Americans think that trade lowers wages uh, and destroys jobs. Only like one out of 10 Americans think that trade raises wages, and about like two out of 10 Americans think that it creates jobs. So you see that there's much more disagreement in terms of like how uh, create, uh, trade uh, affects the livelihoods of people. So if we really kind of want to understand why is there backlash in, uh, against international trade, we really need to understand how is trade impacting inequality in lives uh, of uh, individuals. Uh, so, it, so what I'm going to do today is kind of give you, a few, uh, you know, some key facts and lessons that we ha have learned from a very large um, um, body of, of research. And uh, what I want to emphasize is that economists, even almost 100 years ago, always predicted that while trade was very good from the perspective of a country as a whole, it actually always generated winners and losers within, within a country. Like even if we assume that it's really easy to get credit for people, that it's really easy to move people to places where there are good jobs, even in those settings, there are some people who are going to be benefiting from trade and others who are going to lose. And now imagine you add like all the kind of frictions that make it harder to get a loan, right? And like harder or hard to move to places where they're family. But even like in completely frictionless world, economists actually, like our theories predicted that uh, trade would make some people worse off, okay? And kind of ray, potentially raise uh, inequality. However, uh, what we have learned uh, by looking, this was theory, uh, and what we have done as economists is we actually, like in the past tw 25 years, we actually said, well, this is what the theory says. Let's now actually look at the data because, uh, you know, over, since the 1980s, we actually have very detailed data that can follow either families or workers or people over time and kind of uh, see like how, you know, how do their lives change when their countries experience large trade policy changes, okay? And we can do the same thing with companies. And let's learn what actually happens in reality, okay? So this, this graph shows us like how much the world has actually globalized. So, you know, how do we measure globalization? One, there are multiple ways to do it, but one way to do it is to basically just check how much do countries all over the world export and import, and then compare there to the overall um, income that these countries make. So that's on the, y, on the x, uh, y axis here. I have world trade as a percent of global GDP. And uh, like the most, con you know, there are multiple measures of globalization. I'm just going to focus the one that we can measure consistently over time. This is uh, trade in goods. And you see that, you know, there was actually quite a bit of globalization in the 1870s, uh, 1890s. But then the two world wars and the uh, Great Depression, uh, uh, you know, uh, led to collapse of global trade. But trade has then, after World War II, slowly recovered and really taken off, like basically starting in 1980s and really 1990s. That's kind of called the period of hyperglobalization. So what I'm going to do today is kind of focus on a few examples of countries that have undergone large traderizations themselves by basically lowering their uh, taxes on imports or experience uh, increased access to uh, markets of, uh, of their exporters during this time period and kind of uh, uh, 
and, and then show you like what, you know, what have we learned about how trade affects uh, inequality, both in rich countries and in poor countries. So uh, what, what's the, uh, what are some key facts? The number one thing that I want to uh, take, uh, the, that I want you to take away is that trade is not the main um, driver of increased inequality. We have observed in richer countries like United States and United Kingdom, as well as poorer countries like China or, or India. It contributes to kind of aggregate inequality, but it's not the main uh, factor. And we get this result regardless of what type of methodology economists rely, rely on, okay? However, what we have also learned is that how trade, um, I that trade still has really important implications for workers' earnings and employment opportunities, and through that, it shapes inequality in much more nuanced way. And I'm gonna kind of focus on three key facts that kind of highlight these nuances that actually kind of suggest, even though trade is not the large contributor to inequality as a whole, we should actually be still quite concerned about its impact on, on inequality. Okay, so let me start with uh, the first fa uh, fact. Uh, so I, I mentioned to you that we usually, you know, kind of as economists, we usually assume that in the, you know, right after, um, you know, somebody gets unemployed, they're gonna be unemployed, but sooner or later they can, you know, move, like, you know, either get another job where they live or they can move somewhere else where there are, are more job opportunities. What, what we have actually found when we start looking at the data is that trade has really uh, geographically concentrated uh, effects. So, um, uh, so, you know, how you as an individual are gonna be affected by trade is gonna depend a lot on, uh, on uh, where you live. So if you are an individual that lives in a region that has high concentration of industries that benefit from exporting, that's go, uh, you're gonna be uh, having higher earnings and more employment opportunities than individuals in other, regi other regions of the country. But if you are an individual living in a region where most of the industry is concentrated uh, in industries that, uh, that compete with imports, okay, you, you're, you're gonna have lower earnings opportunities and lower employment opportunities relative to other regions, okay? And this was, this, you know, this, this finding has been first uh, observed in India by Petya Tupalova, and she basically explained it by the fact that people were just not moving very easily across uh, regions. And in India, part, you know, part of the reason why people were not moving is because they relied on the caste network to supply uh, uh, kind of uh, public goods and, uh, and, and informal insurance because the government was not, uh, you know, th there were not many uh, kind of government services in that, that regard. But what people have found that it's also the case you know, somewhat in China or like in, even in the United States. So let me kind of highlight the, the, these effects uh, in um, uh, first for in, in a scenario where I'm gonna focus on the kind of benefits of trade by focusing on China. So uh, ma many of us think that like, you know, uh, consider China as one of the key countries that has really benefited from globalization uh, over the past uh, 30 years. And indeed, like, you know, China as a whole definitely has, but these effects have been actually quite differentiated within, within China. So in particular, uh, you know, one aspect through which China has globalized is it entered World Trade Organization, which is an organization that negotiates lower barriers to trade in 2001. And uh, if, you see, if you look at like, you know, what happened in China's employment, like this is, this is 2001, we see that as a re like employment in agriculture kind of decreased after w uh, World uh, Trade Organization entry, whereas employment in services and manufacturing uh, grew. And oftentimes when we think about countries like China, moving people out of kind of self-sufficient agriculture toward manufacturing and services is exactly how economic progress happens. We are moving people toward higher productivity, more productive activities, and through that we are, uh, uh, you know, increasing um, uh, earnings uh, and lowering uh, poverty. And what, we've, what pe people have found in China is that, you know, the WTO entry uh, di actually diff affected different regions of China differently because you know, the, the more heavily, um, uh, kind of more pink regions here were more exposed to exporting opportunities that uh, WTO entry provided, whereas the lighter regions li uh, were, were less exposed to. So people have examined like, you know, how did individuals in areas benefiting more from export opportunities fare relative to the, to the other regions. And what people have found is that if you were uh, a, Ch a Chinese individual who uh, lived in a, more, uh, in, a, in a county that was more exposed to uh, export opportunities, 
you first obso observe like more exports and FDI into that region, as well as expansion of employment in manufacturing, whereas employment in agriculture decreased. And with this, like income and income per capita, uh, impact per, per capita increase and reductions in, pov uh, pov uh, in, in reductions in poverty. So you know, in China, uh, you know, this, this is kind of the usual story that you hear. You also oftentimes hear that you know there were people were actually able to move from areas not so exposed to export opportunities more more, to more toward where the jobs were, especially the young, and also benefited from that. So that's kind of like the, the success part of the globalization that's geographically concentrated. Okay, from now on in the talk, I'm gonna focus on the negative consequences of trade. Not because I wanna de-emphasize the positive consequences. You know, I, I wanna emphasize, like I actually think free trade is good from country, for a country's perspective overall, because overall it does generate quite a few gains. But as a society, we very much need to focus on those that get hurt by international trade. And that's what I'm gonna continue to do in the rest of the lecture. So let me give you the other side of the story that we also often hear in the newspapers by you know, how did Chinese exports or Chinese import competition that came to United States impact United States. And again, we can think of United States as being composed of lots of different commuting zones. So just th think about these are like uh, areas where people are uh, kind of, uh, you know, based on where they live, they, are, you know, they can kind of commute to their uh, work. And some of these commuting uh, zones were more, impacting by, more impacted by import competition from China. Why? Because you know, higher concentration of their um, employment was in things like apparel and textile or furniture uh, and so, uh, 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 electronics and so on. So for example, like, you know, we, we are in, uh, you know, I'm from New Hampshire, we are in Massachusetts, you see that these areas were actually pretty negatively impacted by, like exposure to Chinese competition was really, really large based on kind of the type of industry we had. Uh, you know, Providence, Rhode Island is also qu quite nearby here. They were also kind of pretty negatively impacting. As was, you know, Raleigh, North Carolina, they have a lot of uh, furniture stores, as, uh, f furniture uh, factories, as was, for example, San Jose, California, where there was a lot of uh, apparel. Whereas places like Detroit, Grand Rapids, uh, Michigan, Seattle, they were not. Why? Well, because Detroit, for example, was very negatively affected by increase in, uh, increases in, um, uh, for example, uh, increased competition uh, with Japan uh, in car industry, but not, it was not so much exposed to, to the Chinese import competition because of its, uh, uh, its um, uh, industry mix. Likewise, Seattle, well, Seattle is a perfect example of, uh, of a um, location in the United States that's benefiting tremendously from United States export opportunity. You know, think of, think of Mi Microsoft, Apple, and so on. You know, th their economy is booming because of globalization. Again, so they are not exposed to this. Uh, so what, what do people find uh, it happens in these areas, you know, such as New Hampshire, such, such as parts of Massachusetts or, or Rhode Island, uh, or you know uh, parts of North, North Carolina where uh, that that were very heavily affected by uh, by uh, Chinese competition. Well, what people find is that uh, uh, jobs in manufacturing uh, uh, disappear. Uh, jobs in non-manufacturing also disappear in those area. Why? Because well, if people are losing manufacturing jobs, they also can't afford going to the restaurants. They can't purchase as much in, in the stores. So kind of all the services are also uh, are also uh, declining. And then we observe increases in uh, unemployment. And what's actually really worrisome is that uh, people actually you have we have prolonged unemployment, but then people actually exit the labor force. Um, and, uh, and that's actually really uh, worrisome because it's much harder to re-enter uh, the labor force once you, once you, uh, once you uh, exit it. Uh, and, uh, you know, and some of those people then uh, start uh, uh, taking social security and disability uh, uh, insurance, okay? Uh, it gets even more st stark in terms of who is negatively affected by import competition when we differentiate between people in these areas that have uh, uh, you know that, that have that have college education or in those that do not. So if you look at like college educated workers, you see that they also that, that they initially observe decline in manufacturing employment, but you see that they actually are able to switch to jobs in non-manufacturing in those areas. They have smaller increases in unemployment, and they are less likely to exit the labor force than kind of overall population. But when we focus on individuals that do not have a college degree, things get really difficult. You, you observe that you have like large decline in manufacturing employment, non-manufacturing employment, and then really uh, like much, uh, much larger 
uh, uh, effect of like exiting the uh, exiting the workforce. Okay, so the, the, you know, so these are kind of like the these are like very kind of concentrated negative effects of import competition that are that are concentrated in these you know kind of uh, uh, more uh, d darkly highlighted pockets uh, in in the United States. What I just want to you know, I started off with the positive story of China. Uh, I also want to mention, like, even in China, there are areas in China that are suffering from import competition. They, these tend to be more rural areas that used to focus on agriculture. You know, China does not have comparative uh, advantage in agriculture. They actually import a lot of agriculture from United States. So they, are, like, they are too are getting hurt, which, and it's interesting. We usually don't hear about agricultural workers in China as being negatively affected by globalization, but they are. And, and long term, they are also getting negatively affected because uh, as they age, you know, it used to be the case that their children would take care of them when they aged. Um, in China, you don't get much of a social security, especially if you live in the rural area, but your children are now also living in the cities. So you no longer can rely at the old age for that support that your children provided in the past. And it's interesting, like we never hear about that part of, chi uh, of that story in China, but you know, what we have to keep in mind, like in the United States, as, as is the case in China, there are always going to be some areas that are going to be benefiting from uh, trade and others that are going to be losing. Uh, and um, you know, that's just kind of fact of like how globalization happens. And uh, you know, over the long run, we would hope that people can actually move from areas that are losing toward areas that are benefiting. But what we are finding in research is that while it is, you know, in some cases, especially if you're young, you can move toward you know, toward places where there are new jobs. So, you know, think of like young Chinese moving to coastal areas or young, you know, Vietnamese uh, individuals w w w uh, uh, moving to, uh, to, to the coastal areas or, you know, you, you will be moving all over the United States. But on the other hand, there are gonna be people who are not gonna be able to take advantage of that. And especially what we are finding is if you are in an area w that was negatively affected by globalization, it's really hard to move out of that. Uh, so let me come to the second fact which is that these kind of adverse effects of import competition are actually persist and can sometimes actually even get bigger over time. And this is again, if we didn't look at the data, this is not what our economic models are telling us, okay? Um, okay, so let me, uh, let me first continue with the example of uh, United States that I sh just showed you. So this study also uh, that, uh, examines the effects of um, import competition with China on workers in the United States. But what it does is the following. It actually uses information, kind of, you know, uh, anonymized information from kind of social security earning records. And it basically knows for each worker uh, at the beginning of, basically kind of, when China sh shock started hitting, uh, it knows like, were you, did you work in an industry that was ex more exposed to this Chinese competition? And what they do is, because they actually don't know how educated you are in this data, but they can actually know, are, are you the worker who is at the, uh, who earns very little, so you're kind of like at the bottom third of the earnings, like if you kind of compare them across all workers. So those are going to be people uh, described, uh, like, uh, like um, their effects are going to be in kind of this uh, red uh, columns. And then they also compare those workers, as well as they look at workers that are kind of high earners, so they're in the top third of the earnings distribution in the United States. The effects of this Chinese competition on those workers are going to be in these uh, uh, dark, uh, dark colored uh, columns. And what they do, what this study does is basically examines like you in 91 and checks how exposed you were initially through the industry where you worked in in 91 to Chinese import competition. And then because they actually have information about your social security records, also like times of unemployment, they actually know how, how this effect accumulated over your lifetime. And what do they find? What they actually find is that the overall effect you see is very negative on cumulative earnings for people who are in the bottom tercile of uh, income distribution. But overall, for people who started off kind of as the higher earners in the top tercile, uh, the, the overall effect is not that large. And it's really interesting to find, like, you know, why is that such a large effect? So you see that, like, the, the initial impact of Chinese competition in the initial firm that the worker is worked in are, is actually pretty similar for lower earners and for high earners. They both, like, they both lose cumulative earnings as a result of that. But what, what you see there is that higher earners can then actually gain income by eventually switching to different firms in the same industry and ultimately switching to uh, other sectors. Why? Because higher earners tend to usually be more educated and they just have kind of the tools or skills 
or perhaps income to be able to adjust. But if you are from a, low, uh, uh, from a lower, uh, earning, uh, lower earner, you see that like, you're much less likely to uh, gain uh, cumulative earnings due to being able to switch to different firm in the same sector, and you really do not, you actually lo you, you don't gain earnings from switching to other sector. So again, we are here seeing is that these effects are actually really long lasting. For, you know, for low earners, like the, you know, they basically lose almost 20% in cumulative earnings relative to the kind of what they would be earning in the absence of uh, uh, Chinese competition, whereas higher earners are actually able to adjust. Like things are not easy initially, but ultimately they can kind of adjust. Uh, and and this, is, this is really puzzling. As economists, we usually thought, yeah, you know, people are going to have like a rough patch initially, but eventually they'll be able to adjust. But this, you know, this also helps explain, you know, some of these lower earners potentially were the ones who are also exiting the la labor force because they, they are just not able to find jobs and they lose hope. Uh, this, is, this also happens in Brazil. So we only have two studies where you can really follow, uh, so far, where you can really follow workers for like multiple, you know, up to 20 years. You can do that also in Brazil. Um, so let me tell you, like Brazil also, uh, 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 in 91, implemented a large trade policy change that also increased import competition. So think of like this trade policy change as being like similar type of shock as like chi increase in Chinese competition was in the United States. And what people find here is that, um, you know, again, people were affected by this import uh, uh, liberalization in early 90s, and then uh, researchers were able to follow individuals 20 years after the liberalization through similar type of administrative data and see like how were they affected. And again, people found that initially import competition lowered wages, uh, lower earnings, and lowered uh, uh, employment. But what was actually, in, and this is especially in the uh, formal sector, but these effects actually magnified, got worse over time, which was a little bit puzzling initially. Like you're like, how could they get worse over time? And you know, part of the reason why it happens is because there's lack of mobility across regions. People are not, uh, people are not moving out of negatively affected area toward more opportunities. But what's, what, what really actually matters in Brazil is that uh, some of the, part of the reason why earnings actually get worse over time is because um, uh, capital, so investments also like only slowly adjust over time. So in particular, what this research did is it basically, you know, this is the timeline of, uh, uh, this is just timeline. This is the period when trade liberalization happened. So this is, you know, this basically this is where the trade liberalization stops. And you see that as a result of, uh, you know, in, in these graphs show us what was the effect of trade liberalization or import competition on size of the factories and number of, of formal factories. And what you see here is that Pretty quickly, number of factories dropped, and that state kind of uh, uh, no, uh, um, establishment kind of establishment size dropped, decreased, and then kind of stayed stable. But you see that the number of formal firms actually slowly decreased uh, in areas more affected by import competition. And so, what's happening? Well, what's happening is that let's say you were a, a factory owner, and you just like right before liberalization um, invested into this factory. Well, you can, you're going to try to hold on to like, your factory as long as you can until, you, like, it's, it's until your, uh, you know, your capital depreciates. So what you see happens is in areas that are more hard hit by import competition, you see that new en entry of new establishments drops right away. So you see there's a drop, and then it doesn't really change. But factories only slowly exit. So basically kind of the negative effect of factory exit uh, on job destruction kind of accumulates slowly over time, and then there's less job creation. And because of that, there's less, you know, basically earnings uh, decrease more like kind of slowly over time, as well as um, employment opportunities. In Brazil, these effects are actually a little bit mitigated because some of, the, some of the people actually switch to the informal sector, unlike in the United States where they actually kind of just switch out of the labor force. Uh, but if you just look at kind of like the formal market, there's actually this negative effect that's a little bit counteracted by the, uh, by the informal sector. So here again, we have a rich country and middle income country, very similar effects of import competition. Like they are, they are kind of, for, for in those pockets that are really negatively affected, these effects are kind of persistent and long lasting. Okay, and I think like in the United States, for example, oftentimes this trade liberalization, like an import shock with China, kind of shut down the last factory in, in a town that didn't have many other opportunities and you know, people became pretty hopeless um, and life was very, very tough. Okay, the third com uh, point that I wanna make is, right now I mostly focused on workers, right, and earnings and employment opportunities. But the third way thing that we need to think about is that 
these uh, import competition can actually have long lasting effects also by affecting the investments into the next generation through, through education. And here I'm gonna conclude with a study that focused on India's uh, import liberalization in 91. So India, like Brazil, in 91 basically drastically reduced imp uh, its uh, barriers to, uh, to uh, imports. For example, in India, taxes on imported products drop on average by 60 percentage points. That, that's a large drop. And you see again that like in India, different areas were differentially affected by this uh, trade policy. And in particular, you know, this is actually the study that started this whole literature by Petya Topolova. It's a beautiful study. Like she actually showed that like this mo mobility of workers across districts was for employment was really low. So only 1% of like rural, rural individuals moved within 10 years uh, of trade realization and less than 5% of urban individuals move for employment within, uh, uh, within, within 10 years. So what she, because of this low mobility, what she found is that like even though during this time period, poverty in India was decreasing, wages were increasing, uh, they, they were actually decreasing less in areas hard hit by, uh, by trade realization. But this in India actually has consequences also for children because you know, before liberalization, only 55% of rural children ages 10 to 14 attend schools and actually almost a quarter of them work as a primary activity. And you know, in India is not unique in that respect. Uh, in you know, lower, uh, lower income countries, a lot of children work, or, uh, work and not go to school. Uh, so trade here bec uh, is gonna be affecting also a, a family's decision whether or not to ch send a child to school. Uh, uh, or not, and what people uh, and what people have found is that like in, how like that family income actually really plays a large role. And in this particular case, income f families in India in uh, uh, industries uh, in regions with uh, that were hit by import competition, their income dropped. And what we observe then is that these areas observe declines in school attendance relative to uh, uh, to other places of uh, India, declines in literacy. Uh, declines in school completion, and then if you do kind of back up the envelope calculations, that leads to pretty large uh, um, decreases in kind of lifelong uh, income. Again, because of the norms in India, j uh, girls actually bore most of, of this cost. When families paid this, this difficult decision, you know, on trying to save on schooling costs, they pulled uh, girls out of school before they uh, pulled boys. What was interesting is like these girls were either working in kind of household chores they did not work in market work or they were actually idle because like, you know, par their parents were not able to find jobs, right? Like, so they were, they were not uh, either. And what's interesting here is that, you know, f families who live at subsistence have to make really hard costs. And here it's not because they are like getting extra income from, uh, from children working. They really are just basically saving on kind of sc sc schooling fees. So the hope, kind of the hopeful message of this, uh, uh, of this, uh, uh, paper and result is that, you know, governments by targeting and kind of subsidizing schooling costs, maybe through providing midday meals or, uh, you know, providing clothing or school supplies can actually help some of these children stay in school because families here are basically saving on, 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 uh, on school, schooling costs. So let me, you know, kind of let me, um, you know, uh, conclude with a few uh, takeaways. So, you know, I started off saying is that like in order to understand why there's backlash against globalization in United States and UK. And you know, maybe it will happen also in lower income countries, once they, like, like China, once they stop, stop growing so fast, so then these kind of inequalities become more present. Uh, uh, we, we have this backlash because trade, uh, trade generates winners and losers. And you know, that's again, not news to us because, because we always knew that like trade, like technology, like changes in our tastes are always gonna create some jobs and destroy some jobs, okay? But what we have found in, in like through numerous studies is that what's concerning is that these effects of import competition in the United States and in lower income countries are very geographically concentrated, both in terms of uh, uh, negative earnings and employment losses. They are also very persistent uh, you actually find like lack of adjustment of displaced workers, you know, up to like 10 to 20 years after the initial policy change. And then what's also really concerning that these adverse effects also have additional spillovers uh, on the communities because they affect the, uh, the education of, um, of um, uh, next generation. 
And you know, depending on the, um, the, the, the way uh, public finance is structured in a particular country, they can also kind of deplete the, um, the tax revenue of, of the uh, community that's negatively affected and through that provision of, um, of public goods. So you know, for all of those uh, students in the, uh, in the audience, you know, kind of I think big challenge that you have ahead of you in, uh, is to figure out you know, how does the society, how do we as a society address, uh, address this challenge? Because it's, it's not gonna go away. So thank you very much. A nice talk about the global trade, but I have a quick question about the issue in China. So is it a possibility that China itself has a trade policy like tariff and uh, and the taxes on the foreign goods that control the international trade. Yeah, so uh, excellent point. So you know, China actually, like, even though it joined the World Trade Organization, it actually had like still, you know, up to then and like even following, it actually had pretty complicated set of both like import barriers to trade as well as like kind of uh, uh, policies that were supporting certain uh, export sectors. Uh, with China, the, the other thing that uh, people point out to is. Uh, the fact that uh, that it actually the government subsidizes state-owned enterprises and subsidies to the target particular firms are actually illegal within the World Trade Organization. So that's actually like one of the disputes. Uh, that's that's, that's kind of an ongoing uh, issue. Uh, I mean, China did uh, respond to uh, President Trump's tariffs, right, by uh, increasing tariffs uh, on some U U.S. goods. So uh, you know, uh, that's always the. Uh, concern when one country, uh, you know, uh, raises tariff that other countries will respond, uh, you know, and we're going to have a trade war. Part of the reason why a World Trade Organization was created after World War II in 1947 was to avoid escalation of um, of tariff increases and kind of competitive devaluations that happen during the Great uh, Depression. Uh, Countries kind of agreed to be in this equilibrium where they didn't do that, and like WTO was able was enabling countries to do that. But it looks like you know that that system uh, has kind of broken down because the United States is not following its rules. Yeah. Uh, can I have a, a follow up question? Mm -hmm. So the follow up question is that argument from Chinese Chinese media. So the argument is following. So if they if they don't have subsidized state owned government state owned company, then there will be a huge unemployment from the collapsing of state owned company because this given its market inefficiencies. So uh, do you think in this case that uh, it is legitimate for protecting their own? Mm -hmm. You mean, it's a, it's a very interesting question, right? Like, so China, China followed, you know, China has benefited a lot from globalization, but it did not follow the usual prescription that like the World Bank would suggest, right? It actually, like it was very controlled liberalization with, with exactly what you said. Uh, you know, is it justified or not? Like, you know, you, there you are weighing kind of like um, efficiency losses from economic terms from like social unrest. And actually there's an excellent paper by a assistant professor, I think it's, she's at Harvard Business School now, who actually shows that chi like subsidies and state, like are basically, uh, the, that SOEs are basically more supported in areas where they are more, uh, where China is more worried about social unrest. So they are doing exactly what you are Suggesting, and you know, and that's a as an economist, I can give you what the trade-off there is. Like, you know, basically, you're definitely, uh, you're, you know, you're definitely uh, balancing kind of the loss in efficiency. Uh, per, you know, perhaps also, you know, like there might be some talented firms that are not getting credit, right? So maybe try, like the, the counterfactual could be like, could China grow even faster, right? To kind of containing the social, uh, containing the social uh, unrest. You know, the big, you know, the big challenge for China going forward, it, it grew very fast until recently, in part because, you know, it's um, initially it was it, like it was uh, resources were so misallocated. And then when they started building, they grew a lot in terms of like returns to capital, like they had young population. But now the population is aging. Productivity actually has an increase. And over the longer run, the only way you can sustain growth is by actually improving productivity as opposed to increased population or in, in, increased, um, you know, kind of investment. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the mm -hmm. answer. So I wanted to ask a question about you. The last one was like, how does society address this challenge? Um, you kind of like alluded at the beginning as if the United States was making a decision to go to protectionism, as if it was a decision like against efficiency, as if maybe there was some type of consideration about individuals as opposed to like overall a country's economic efficiency. Do you think that this is a like a question that should be and can be answered by like economic research in terms of like 
from an efficiency standpoint? Or is this kind of like a question that like economists have to answer as like citizens and people as opposed to like coming from a scientific perspective? Uh, well, hopefully both, right? So like as an econ like so I think, you know, I think there's, um, I can make a moral ar argument why we should like, and I very much personally believe that we need to, you know, the society needs to provide for the people who are hurt and are struggling, okay? Like I can make that argument. But I think even like you can make an economic argument because, uh, you know, first of all, I just showed you that like, you know, these negative consequences actually affect education of future generation who had nothing to do, right? Like we, with, you know, why some people lost jobs, right? So we always, I think like as a society, we pride ourselves like starting everybody with the same opportunity. Uh, the other thing that I would mention is that like, even if you don't care at all about the moral aspect of it, and if you just care about efficiency, well then it should be in your interest for technology changes and trade changes to be as smooth as possible. That cannot happen if people, if the country is being protectionist, right? So like from that perspective, one could argue, argue it. But you know, personally, uh, I feel that, you know, personally I believe that a public sector can actually provide some really good investments that benefit society as a whole. And you know, number one thing, things, things like education and infrastructure, you know, everybody benefits from those, right? Uh, so th those are very easy, uh, those are very easy to do. They are much, you know, this is much more accepted in Europe than in the United States. Uh, and you know, what's interesting is that like apart from U United Kingdom, which is, you know, in terms of its, um, political structure more similar to US uh, in terms of kind of deregulation and so on than, than the other uh, uh, kind of in welfare than, uh, than other uh, European countries. There really was not much backlash to international trade in you know, country like Sweden or, or Germany. And, and people believe in part because they have uh, safety nets in place that, you know, that don't protect um, a job but they protect the worker and help workers kind of transition, transition uh, smoothly. You know, the other thing that like re is really tricky in the United States is insurance, right? Because when you lose a job, you oftentimes also in lose health insurance. So again, you're losing health insurance in the more vulnerable part of your life, right? And that's where like actually a lot, you know, I I interestingly, uh, you know, um, Affordable Care Act has actually kind of helped quite a bit uh, with that because it gives people an option to an insurance that they can afford if they don't have it through uh, an employer provided uh, health insurance. So, you know, I, I feel like I can make moral arguments to it, but I think there are also like good economic arguments to it. Uh, and like you know, one way I answer that to you is through, you know, like this, you know, if m people feel that like even when they're hurt by globalization, you know, there, there are I institutions in the, in the society that help them transition. The other thing you can make is we have learned quite a bit that when, you know, irrespective of trade, when, when uh, we have investments in children really, really early on in their life, those have really positive benefits over, over the long run in terms of higher education, better health, better employment opportunities. So, you know, there are multiple studies by people like Hillary Hoynes and others that actually show that a lot of kind of programs like Head Starts and others uh, that cost initially basically pay themselves off over long run because you know, in, they enable people that were in, uh, born in difficult situations or their families came into difficult situation, get through those difficulties and still get good education and life, so. Awesome, thank you. Do you think that in a, in a counter, counter, sorry, like a perspective from perspe uh, protectionism, uh, shipping, you know, manufacturing jobs abroad strengthens the U.S. position in this globalizing market? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so excellent. So I think what you are asking is like, you, you know, um, manufacturing, like we, you tend to view manufacturing job, jobs as good jobs, right? Is losing them, like actually strengthening U U.S. economy. Is that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is it, do you think it's diminishing it or strengthening it? Well, so, I, you know, actually we do have, I think, uh, I actually think like it's, you know, for the workers where, that lose jobs, they have definitely made worse off. But from the economy as a whole, we are specializing according to comparative advantage, right? Like United States has comparative advantage in, uh, uh, in a lot of service industry, think about, you know, like our largest exporters are things like financial, you know, in addition to agriculture, it's financial services, it's business services, it's higher education, uh, it's design. Uh, so th 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 that's where kind of the future jobs are, that's where productivity growth is, right? So basically by uh, g g moving people out of manufacturing toward those jobs, like, you know, that's actually increasing earnings. The problem is that uh, what, what happens is that usually it's not the workers who are losing, as I've shown, right? It's not the jo workers that are losing jobs in manufacturing, especially the less educated ones that are getting these other jobs. It's usually kind of younger workers or people that are more educated. But from the perspective of U.S. comparative advantage, it's absolutely kind of, 
overall prosperity, like, you know, like specializing according to comparative advantage, like is good for our welfare, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the college. Thank you for coming. Thank you. There we go. Uh, I have a technical question that I might ask you at a different time, but uh, this being a liberal arts setting, you know, and I know how much this group would eat this up. I want to ask a slightly different question about trade and isolationism um, and protectionism. And that is, um, I'm not too studied in this, but I thought one of one motivation of the WTO and some of this original drive after World War II was basically world peace through empathy of getting goods from other places and thinking like, oh, right, there's other people on this end. You know, I know this country just simply through the goods that I consume. So over the past, uh, I don't know, five years, you know this better than I do. It seems like we're slightly heading in the opposite direction, maybe not where we were in the 30s or anything, but... Uh, I guess I wonder if you've ever thought about those issues. Yeah, excellent question. I, I, absolutely, I want to emphasize that, like, you know, yeah, big part of the reason was not just like to support trade for like better, better economic prosperity, but it was really very much to like basically people believe that if people are trading with each other, they are less likely to fight with each other, right? Like, so it was really kind of supporting, uh, it was really kind of supporting peace. And, and same, like, you know, for e European community, it was also kind of bringing all the, you know, bringing, uh, you know, Germany and France and U UK together, right? Like it was again, like idea was, let's rely on each other, let's be peaceful to, uh, to each other. Uh, so, uh, so, so yes, uh, uh, I, I am, you know, in World Trade Organization, I would say, like, actually it was quite successful um, until, like, the last, you know, 2016 or so, because, you know, and I think its biggest test was the Great Recession. So, like, during Great Recession, trade collapsed, but it didn't collapse before because countries raised their trade barriers, even though a lot of countries, like starting with the United States and then the financial crisis kind of percolated every, like other places, countries suffered, but they didn't raise protectionism. I mean, there were some increases, but like fairly minor. So that was actually a good sign is that like, actually countries are complying according to, uh, by WTO rules. And you know, and even countries like India who would be able to raise protectionism legally because they like, uh, what, what World Trade Organization does, it basically kind of bounds your tariffs. It says, like, well, you can raise your tariffs, but you can't go about cer certain bound. And countries like India have pretty la large bounds, so they could actually increase their tariffs quite a bit, but they didn't. Uh, so I think WTO was actually working quite well until it, it didn't. Uh, and I think part of the problem why it doesn't now is because you need large players like European Union, like United States, like China to comply with its... Um, regulation and when United States basically blocks uh, appointments of uh, uh, of judges to the appellate body of World Trade Organization so basically for those of you who are not familiar with trade World Trade Organization actually has this kind of almost like a court within itself it's called the appellate body that basically adjudicates any disputes that happen among its uh, tr trade members and basically that rule like basically it adjudicates you know who if a rule was violated or not and they are basically like they are judges who are on that uh, on that uh, on, on on that appellate body, um, and then country even has the either has the option to remove that violation or like other countries can impose sanctions on it. So you always kind of have a choice how you react to the ruling, but like you one way or the other, like you know you need to kind of undo the negative effects of the um, of the um, of the regulation. Well, United States actions basically disabled that, uh, that, um, that body, which was really important uh, for disputes. So you know, yeah, World Trade Organization, it's kind of stalled. I mean, it was kind of stalled from 2001 onwards, like, I'm not sure. I, the first time I taught international trade, 99 was when Seattle riots happened uh, with the World Trade Organization. I'm not sure how many of you remember that. I know many of you were not even born then. Uh, and then World, Tra World Trade Organization decided, well, maybe we should have the next meeting in Qatar because nobody can <laughs> protest there. That also didn't go so well. Uh, but at least people were not like, like you know, there was no further liberalization, but people were, not, people were still playing by its rules, including during the 2008 uh, crisis. And now that's not the case. So yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. What, what, what's actually really interesting to me is that U.S. could actually really use World Trade Organization to go after some of the... Um, subsidies that China imposes because there are rules about that, right? But yet, like it has chosen to kind of go, uh, approach it like from a much more isolationist, like nationalistic approach. So it's gonna be interesting to see how it all resolved, uh, resolves. Thank you for this talk. Um, this is not my area of expertise at all, but what I'm most interested in is the persistence and what's driving it and how much of it is people not being able to move, not understanding to move, and so what kinds of policy options would we have then to try to 
make the transition happen more quickly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So it, it seems, you know, like it seems like regard. so like one bit that I didn't mention, part of it is also just kind of like ag ag aggregation or disaggregation economies. That's part why persistence also is there because like, you know, kind of effects for manufacturing go to non-manufacturing sector. But mo lack of mobility is actually pretty, uh, you know, it underlies all of it. Uh, too. And, you know, in some of it is just social norms, right? Like, for example, like in India, it, it's, uh, it's like reliance on the caste system, right? So then, how, you know, can one change the norms? It's, that, that's really hard to do. Uh, you know, s some of it is, uh, you know, some of it in the United States is that, like, in areas that are depressed, housing becomes much cheaper, right? So people can afford a house in a depressed area, but not if they move to uh, a place that's booming, right? Like, is there, you know, so there, like, is there something we can do with the housing policy that, address, uh, that addresses the kind of zoning, for example, right? That, that, that's one thing that, like, people are talking about in, in, in the United States. The third thing, I mean, a lot of it is actually information, uh, because oftentimes we learn about, I mean, I, I live in an area where, you know, we have Hanover, New Hampshire, where there's Dartmouth College, people, you know, like, the median degree is master's degree, and then we are surrounded with towns where, uh, you know, uh, you know, people just don't have the same sort of opportunities. So, like opportunities that my children have, just by listening to whoever is around, in terms of like what jobs are available, are very different from, you know, opportunities that a child that lives like two towns down uh, town has. So, you know, you, people people don't go to Boston to like. It, I mean, it seems like kind of shocking, right? But like some people just stay in the local market as opposed to go to Boston, to where there would be substantially more jobs, right? Uh, and some of it they they can't afford housing or. Uh, the, the, the deposit that one has to put up, right, for like for, to, to rent something, uh, to rent something in Poston, but some of it is also information. With, uh, there's actually a really interesting, uh, so one thing that's actually interesting here is that especially uh, what people have started doing is there are quite a few randomized control trials that kind of look at various, um, kind of either kind of active labor market policies or information um, or information campaigns in terms of try to figure out how do we inform workers about job opportunities elsewhere and kind of, uh, um, or help companies um, recruit workers where there's this mismatch between like labor demand and labor supply. And a lot of those don't work so well, but like what, like some of the information campaigns actually tend to uh, work better. So like my, and you know, and so my hope is that, and this is like mostly from developing countries' perspectives, uh, uh, evidence, I'm hoping that over the long run, you know, we keep trying and see like what works, what doesn't, and learn from that. I mean, I think Denmark actually, their unemployment, uh, like the office that is in charge of unemployment insurance, they actually all the time interact with academics and experiment in terms of like how long should be unemployment insurance, like what, what, what other programs should be there and so on. And they basically learn with things that don't work and then like they try again. And I, I love this kind of connection between policymakers and academics to, you know, they basically realize like world is complicated. It keeps changing. Let's figure out what works and what doesn't work. And I, I wish like more countries, uh, policymakers in other countries had that approach uh, to it. Because uh, I think like you can really, if you can bring, a, you know, uh, researchers in there who have the tools to kind of set up various, you know, policy experiments uh, and kind of test them on a smaller scale, you can, you can, you, know, you don't actually have to spend that much money to figure out like what's, what's helping and what's not. Thank you. Uh, <laughs>